do. So oh, that's lovely. I'll present that to you, uh, and then it's over to you. It's over to me, and I'll try and leave time for questions. So the session ends at two. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, well, I'll speak from here. I won't use all that time. Uh, you might need the mic to put something on the room. Well, I don't think I'll need the mic to fill this room. Okay. I'll wait for you. Okie dokie. Two years of yelling at students. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll ask you to gather around, and if you see anybody who needs dragging in, drag them in now. Uh, that seems to be most of us. So, uh, so intelligence is, uh, as you know, um, been blessed with a number of uh, people who've really changed how we think about the human mind and uh, individual differences and names that have lasted uh, many, many decades or decades already, Spearman and Galton. Uh, and we're lucky enough to have, uh, receiving a lifetime award this year, Jim Flynn, who I think uh, has made one of the few changes in, in intelligence in our lifetime that uh, perhaps not the man in the street, but the, the academic in the next door department has heard of the, 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 the Flynn effect. Uh, it's an effect that's changed how we think about measurement, how we think about what intelligence is. It's reinvigorated a whole range of, uh, of research areas. Uh, and so in introducing James is going to talk um, in a, a characteristically iconoclastic fashion with a, with a whiteboard. <laughs> Uh, and not using a microphone uh, about, about what intelligence is with a fascinating title that I think will have you all intrigued about what the content is. Uh, and, and so I'm just going to get out of the way and, and we can hear James. And uh, we've got a little memento. So if you're thinking of a, embarking on a lifetime of work, you could have many people's appreciation at the end of it for having enlightened and improved the world. And so it's a great pleasure that I give you this uh, memento of our appreciation for your work in our field. This is the second. Uh, everyone hear me? Any problems? Right. Uh, yelling at students gives you a projection for your voice, doesn't it? I still lecture in two courses. Uh, I feel honored by this presentation. It was something that. Uh, helped my self-esteem in an area that has always been a secondary area for me. As many of you know, I'm primarily a moral philosopher who got involved in the IQ area because he was writing a book in which I wanted to show empirical evidence that people who held racial ideologies were incorrect. And I then stumbled across a thinker who in no way was racist, but had a large empirical body of evidence that indicated that on average blacks were genetically handicapped for IQ and that led me into the intelligence area. And it was 10 years ago that I was a featured speaker. And I, this is 10 years that have been exciting for me. This new area posed many intellectual challenges. And I'm only going to speak to one of those now, but it has to do with the fact that in highly developed nations, that IQ seems to be actually either in stasis or declining. And I want to emphasize that I've had the aid of Michael Scher, because just as I was inspired when I spoke to you 10 years ago by Piaget, uh, Michael Scher's expertise on Piaget illuminated what I have to say today. So in a way, I've come full circle. Now, why might IQ gains be in a period of at least stasis, if not decline? We have to watch our step for a moment, because the strongest data comes from the Nordic nations. And it was important for me to realize, at least, that these tend to be people of about 18 or 19 years old. And they give the impression of a general IQ decline, but I'm going to argue that IQ trends differ by age. And this is a limited age group. 
And when we put it into a fuller perspective, the picture becomes much more mixed. But why might IQ be starting to decline? Well, let's remember why it rose. Because of the Industrial Revolution, you had a number of social trends. For one thing, you had a smaller family size. And the more adults to children in the home, the better the environment. The child, for example, from an early age is surrounded by adult speak rather than just other kids their age. Also, uh, with growing prosperity and parents looking forward to educating their children, they began to invigorate the home. They began to get educational toys. They began to think about planning for the children's eventual education. Uh, every city, thank heavens, is not like New York, where you have children being taken to developmental specialists at the age of three to make sure they'll get to Harvard and things of this sort. But still, there's much more of a nurturing atmosphere for intelligence, much more reading to children. And as I say, you have the increased number of adults to children in the home. Well, that has to tail off, doesn't it? I mean, if you had fewer children in the home, we virtually wouldn't be reproducing ourselves. And I think in many middle-class countries, parents have virtually learned about all the tricks they know in terms of educational toys. So that spur to IQ gains during the 20th century is one that we would think would show limiting returns. Schooling has been interesting. The question is quality of schooling versus the extent of schooling. And for a long time, at least, prolonging the number of years that people were in school added immensely to adult vocabulary. <coughs> but you didn't find so many adult vocabulary gains actually on the WISC, that is, during the school years. They tended to show up on the weights, which, of course, was indicative of the fact that, let's say, in 1950, you had only about 12% of adults who had some tertiary education, whereas today it's 52%. So the prolonged exposure to education meant adult gains, not so much, however, in the school. What's happened in the schools in terms of quality? One of the measures that there hasn't been the sort of progress one might have hoped for is the very minimal arithmetical gains during the school year. That is, of all the subtests, arithmetic shows one of the lowest gains. And over the past 50 years, we have actually done very little to encourage kids to become numerate at school. Another trend that's very disturbing over the last 30 or 40 years has been the fact that people have stopped reading. That is, all of the indications from the American surveys that have been done, and I've certainly verified these in New Zealand, is that the percentage of adults, at least, who read for pleasure, anything serious, that is, novels, poetry, plays, has actually diminished during a period during which the number of graduates has doubled. So despite the fact that the number of graduates has doubled over that period, people are reading less. Men are down to about 36% of now, who spend even one hour a week in terms of reading for pleasure. So we would expect that adult vocabulary gains would tail off too. You can't extend the number of years that most people are in work forever unless women are going to postpone when they have children and men postpone and women postpone when they will earn a living. You know, it can't go on forever. That's beginning to tail off. So what was a very important source of IQ gains now seems to pay again diminishing returns. And there is even a negative tendency. So that's not entirely borne out on the data, as we'll see. What about jobs? Well, during the 20th century, the Industrial Revolution produced infinitely more challenging jobs than it did in 1900. That is, someone in farming in 1900 was practically a subsistence farmer. Today, a farmer really runs a small business. That is, they have to look at prices, they have to look at costs, they have to run what is really a small enterprise. To say nothing of the enormous gains in things like computer programming, or a banker. A banker used to be someone who just knew who was credit worthy in their area, had some empathy with the local population. Today, they read off projections, statistics. Again, they're virtually like someone running a fairly large-scale enterprise. But today, the economists tell us, 
that for the first time the economy is producing fewer and fewer cognitively demanding jobs and more and more undemanding service work. So the extent to which the greater cognitive demands of occupation fueled IQ gains in the 20th century again seems to be virtually reversing today. Now one thing that hasn't started reversing yet is the enormous gains we've made in terms of stimulating in the health of the aged. That is, when you want to look for the most robust IQ gains today, look at people in retirement age. And I guess eventually we may stimulate them and keep them healthy to the nth degree, but that hasn't happened yet. And one of the most important realizations I've had in recent years was how much IQ gains are age-related. Because as you can see, we'll look at the Dutch data in a moment, but in Holland, if you look at the full data, you find out that in preschool IQ gains have virtually stopped. Well, that's what we would anticipate. You find out among later school children, we don't have stuff for earlier school children, there may have been a slight decline. That seems to mean that over the last 20 or 30 years, we haven't really increased the quality of education for that age group. And it also tallies with what appears to be a greater alienation, particularly of males, from school discipline. So there you may get a slight decline. Interestingly, in Holland, for adults, there are still gains. So we suspect that at least in Holland, maybe the tendency to multiply undemanding service work hasn't bitten yet. And of course, in Holland, you find enormous gains among the aged. One of, there's only one study that actually follows a cohort through and tests them at various ages, and that's the one that uh, Ian Deary has drawn on so much, the Scottish cohort. You have two cohorts that were 15 years apart, but when you look at the data, you find something quite extraordinary, and that is, uh, when you look at the Scottish data, you find that these people who are 15 years apart, uh, you find that when they were tested at school, these kids only were gaining at about 2.7 points per year. By the time they had reached the age of 77, they were gaining 1.65 points a year over those 15 years. In other words, here you have a cohort that was born, I think, what, 1921, 36, and they tested them in school children on ravens, and you find gains that are there. But remember, when you test 11-year-olds, you have dormed for years of schooling. That is, you're not testing how much additional years of schooling add to IQ. 11-year-olds uh, were all in school in the earlier cohort, too. So in terms of measuring quality of schooling, you get a fairly modest increase. When these same kids were 77, the IQ gains over those 15 years were over 16 points. That is over a point a year because there had been such an immense gain in terms of the stimulation and health of the aged by the time they became aged. So one of the most important things I want to say is don't focus primarily just on the Scandinavian data, which is young adults. Because when you have data that covers all age groups, you find, as in the Netherlands, sometimes games are still progressing for one age group, like the aged, a bit for adults, falling off in the late teens, and stasis for the early kids. And you have to really have data at all ages. Ideally, you do what we did in Scotland, and that is follow a cohort through, through all ages. And then we would get a better picture. The only picture I can give you from comparative data comes down to this that if I were to look at a typical advanced country today, I would expect no gains among preschoolers, very slight gains perhaps in the early school years, minimal losses in the high school years, adult years it would depend on the economy, that is what type of jobs were still being produced by the Industrial Revolution. And I would still predict in most advanced countries that you would have large gains at uh, retirement age. And that, I think, would be a much more valid picture of what's going on at present in a typical advanced country 
than the Scandinavian data, though the Scandinavian data of 18-year-olds or 20-year-olds probably reflects again the fact that high schools seem to be engaging particularly males because this is all military data, isn't it? I mean, not only is it of a particular age group, it's of males rather than females. And something bad seems to be happening in terms of the interfacing of males with secondary school education throughout much of the Western world. As you can see then, IQ games fascinated me because I'm partially an amateur historian. And they give you an image of the history of cognitive abilities over time. And I think one of the most neglected areas of historical scholarship is the development of our intellects during the 20th century. And the pattern of IQ games give you many insights in that regard. Let's look at a few nations. America is weird. <laughs> America goes right on gaining at the historic rate right up through 2014. Now again, that's WISP data. It's not the data of young adults in Scandinavia. I uh, haven't been able to isolate data for 18 to 20 year olds, mainly because I'm just too busy on other things that could be done. But the WISP data, in America, it's the historic rate of 0.3 points per year, or three points a decade. And finally, in 2014, the Wechsler people did something I had been always trying to bully them into doing. And they had set IQ gains on a much more firm foundation. What they did was they took the typical performance of the WISC-4 standardization sample in 2002 and then in 2013, they got a group of people that seemed typical of the standardization sample of the WISC-5, and they gave them the WISC-4 and nothing else. So they actually compared typical groups of kids in 2002 and 2014 without any of the confounding variables of kids that were being scored on two different IQ tests and all of that. They found exactly 0.C, 0.C here. And I can't explain why the US data show that, except, and here I betray my bias, it's a more primitive society than Scandinavia. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't actually quite reached diminishing returns for improving the education, particularly of black children. Uh, another thing I should give, however, that is disturbing, that there is a contrary tendency for the home and that not only are we have down to about the minimum of 1.5 to two children a family, but of course there are far more solo parent households, which reverses the ratio of adults to children in the home in an unfavorable direction. And this has certainly increased in America. And why this hasn't bitten more profoundly, I have no explanation. But America is on. That is, at least during the whisk years, we await to see if they'll do a similar experiment for the waste. That would be most interesting. But at least for the whisk years, America trundles right on. <coughs> In Australia, there's fragmentary data for school children on ravens. It's only from the state of Victoria. But I see no reason why trends in Victoria should be typical, atypical of all of Australia. And it doesn't show a very pronounced decline, but it shows there may be a decline in Australia on ravens. In France, there's only one test, and that is the waste. <laughs> and it shows a slight IQ decline. Uh, we await more data from France. We just don't know. But that one study shows there may be an IQ decline in France. Note, by the way, the Nordic data shows that the reversal is the mirror image of the games. That is, the games have been something like, you know, nine points over 30 years. Well, they're 6.85, which is a loss, which is somewhat less, but it's still comparable. But again, it's for males only, and it's only for a certain age group. And again, people have drawn inferences from this, and they should wait a little longer until we have more data from Scandinavian countries. Germany is peculiar in that the very same research design, which seems impeccable during recent years, 
shows that vocabulary gains have been up in Germany, but spatial intelligence gains have been down by almost exactly the same degree. And uh, without a, a more specialized knowledge of what's going on among German speakers, I can't explain that. But all we can say is that the data is mixed. Vocabulary seems to be going up. Spatial seems to be going down. South Korea is undergoing a period of very decisive gains. That's something like six-tenths of a point per year as compared to what you had during the Industrial Revolution in 20th century America at 0.3 a year. So they're gaining at double the rate. I can only speculate about this, but my suspicion is this, that countries like South Korea that are industrializing lickety-split, that is at a much faster rate than England and America did in the early 20th century, energize the process of IQ gains thereby. So if I had to draw a life cycle of IQ gains, I would say countries like America and Britain, I mean, America really started to industrialize only in the post-Civil War era. Britain, of course, started somewhat earlier, but industrialization picked up quite decisively around 1900. And these countries seem to be in a sort of 100-year cycle, where you have quite large IQ gains for most of that 100 years, and then they start to freeze or tail off. And I would hypothesize from the South Korean example that if you industrialize lickety split at about twice the rate, you may only undergo a 50 year cycle with very strong IQ gains over that period, and who knows when they'll reach a limiting figure. But they're probably on a 50 year cycle rather than a 100 year cycle. Developing countries, it all depends if, like South Korea or China or Taiwan, industrialization has taken them by the throat they'll be gaining. The rest of the world is often not so fortunate. I mean, people go around saying that perhaps the genes of countries in the Middle East or Africa impede them. We've got to wait to find out. Some of these countries like Kenya seem to be making very decisive IQ gains. And Kenya's economy is improving. If you go to urban Kenya, you find an extraordinary number of teenagers that speak English, that are computer literate. I would suggest that in certain countries that are undergoing rapid development, they're going to close the IQ gap on the West before the end of the century. I expect that Turkey will have the same IQ as France before the century is out. There are other countries in the developing world that are not so fortunate. You may find some IQ gains. But if the country is in turmoil like the Sudan, with repeated droughts and wars and God knows what, you find that they're making very little progress, except on pictorial tests. That is, they seem to be exposed to modern visual advertising and to the modern visual world much more than other factors that would bring IQ gains. Because leisure time activities can bring IQ gains. Uh, my father, when he was a young man, worked 12 hours a day, six days a week. And when he came home, there wasn't a lot of energy to become involved in leisure that was cognitively stimulating. Today, over the century, there was a lot of cognitively stimulating leisure. But of course, at a certain point, people dip out. That is, they actually want to relax a bit when they get home, rather than spend all their time playing chess and video games and go and what have you. So again, we would think leisure would reach diminishing returns, but for a long time it was very important. Well, it appears that people <coughs> in Sudan are somehow exposed to the modern world of visual culture. I predict some of them have, what, television and smartphones and see advertising. And their IQ profile is good on those, but bad on all the subtests that reflect progress in traditional schooling. And in many of these countries, there's been a reaction in formal education towards Islamification of the system. That is more rote memorization of scripture and less exposure to what we would think of as modern education. You can often, from looking at the IQ profile of a country, you find at least a duplication of what you would suspect if you know something about the history of the country. 
as you suspect when you approach the Sudan, very little gain in terms of formal schooling, but probably a bigger gain on pictorial things where they're exposed to the modern media more. And you often find a, a, a satisfying correspondence in this regard. Uh, what about, however, England? Now, England is a fascinating case. Uh, in England, on ravens, there are not clear signs that IQ gains have stopped, except for the 14 to 16 age group, which again are the sort of kids that are being increasingly alienated by formal schooling. But this is on ravens. The Piagetian tests are of enormous significance here. I told you 10 years ago that the Piagetian tests held for me the key as to why IQ gains over time had been so explosive on ravens and on uh, similarities. And this had to do with Piagetian psychologists who had interviewed Russian peasants who were largely prior to formal education. And they would say to these peasants, you know, uh, what do fish and crows have in common? Typical question of classification. And they would say absolutely nothing. You know, a fish, a crow can peck at a fish, but no fish can eat a crow. And they would say, well, what about they're both being animals? And they'd say they're not animals. One is a bird and one is a fish. And they were completely anti-classification. They were splitters rather than lumpers. Because if you're hunting fish and crows and rabbits, you're interested in how different they are and how they leave different trails when you hunt them. It doesn't seem to you to make any sense at all to classify them in terms of abstract categories. And of course, uh, this was enormously valued data uh, from uh, Luria's interviews. And you remember, they wouldn't take the hypothetical seriously. That is, if you said to them something like, uh, Hamburg is a city in Germany. There are no camels in Germany. Should there be camels in Hamburg? And they would say, I've never been to Germany. <laughs> they pretend that it was important whether there are camels there. And it was a pragmatic question. They weren't about to take the hypothetical seriously. And if you said to them, but what about the fact that Hamburg is in Germany and there are no camels there? They would say perhaps Hamburg is, too, Hamburg is too small a city for camels. They kept converting it from a hypothetical situation into a factual situation. And the same thing about uh, whether there were white bears in Siberia. They would say, where there's always snow, bears are white. And the people would say, well, perhaps if a wise man came from Siberia and told us that, we would accept the testimony. The only bears we've seen are brown bears. So just as Piaget was of enormous interest to me and in giving me an indication as to why the profile of IQ gains had been what it was, today the British Piagetian data, and we only have, sadly, much Piagetian data from Britain, we find that it contrasts with the Scandinavian pattern in a way that's terribly disheartening. I take it the Piagetian tests differ from normal IQ tests in that they draw fairly rigid separations between your cognitive operation. For example, to be on the Piagetian level of 3A, that is the highest Piagetian level, you have to be able to detail, to deal with analysis and to detail with the hypothetical on a highly difficult level. They give them questions like Archimedes and his bath. And they ask them a whole series of questions as to just how Archimedes could, through inference, you know, find out that certain things displaced volume in the bath. And these aren't easy questions, but you have to do them to get on the 3D level. You know, you, uh, if you fall short of that, you're just short of that level. Now, when you look at the Scandinavian data, it's like most Western IQ data. It's done primarily in terms of the mean and the standard deviation. And you find pretty much that if the mean drops a certain point and the standard deviation is pretty much similar, 
Then decimation of the top scores is in accord with the whole symptoms of the curve. If you look at the Piagetian data, it's frightening because you find that if you apply the normal curve to the Piagetian data, that on a test like volume and heaviness, you would predict that from the curve as a whole, the top category should still be above 1%. That's actually 0.53%. That is the decimation of people who are capable of the most advanced Piagetian skills is much greater than you would think just from the decline at the median and treating the curve as a uniform curve through the median and standard deviation. You would say, well, if this were Scandinavian data and I were treating the curve as uniform, you know, maybe rather there should be 1% of people who are above an IQ of 140. And if it tails off, you find that's pretty much what's happened in the Scandinavian data. If you look at the Piagetian data, where there's an absolute standard of who can do the most difficult mental tasks, and you make the prediction in terms of the mass of a normal curve, you would think that twice as many people would be at that level as actually are. You know, the number of people that can deal with Archimedes and his bath ought to still be 1%. It's not. It's a half of 1%. That's why I say the rock may be starting at the top. That is, something may be happening at the top of the curve that is decimating people who have the highest level of cognitive skill, which is only visible in the Piagetian data, where that top group, you know, you can either high jump seven feet or you can't. And you predict from the curve how many people should be able to high jump seven feet still, and you get 1%. But the Piagetian data says you actually have to see who can do it. And only half of 1% can do it. And the same is true of the other Piagetian tests. If you look at equilibrium, it's even worse. From the tendencies at the mean and standard deviation, you would predict that in the highest category, there would be 20%. They're 4.8 percent, so that's a ratio of four to one of people who can do the most difficult tasks who can still high jump seven feet. You know, there ought to be 20 percent who can do it. There are four percent who can do it. If you look at pendulum and balance, you would say, well, 27 percent should be able to do it. That's 11.65 percent. Again, a ratio of two to one. So just as Piaget held the key, I think to the surge of IQ gains, it tells us something terribly disheartening about what's going on among people who are capable of the most exacting mental skills. They are not diminishing purely as you would expect from looking at tendencies at the mean. They are diminishing at double or four times the rate that you would expect from applying the mass of a normal curve. They're just not capable of operating on the formal level, the highest part of the formal level. Now, uh, there are some doubts that have been raised by the Wechsler people. We have been in something of a debate about when similarities gains have tailed off. I predicted in my 2012 book that all the trends showed that the big gains in similarities would go down. I was predicting on data up to about 2000, because the tendency was for similarities to tail off. The Wechsler people have tried to persuade me that they tailed off much earlier, and I've shown them that there's contrary data. But it's not terribly important. It doesn't discredit Piaget. Formal schooling enormously increases your ability to classify. And it may be that most of the huge <coughs> similarity gains were pre-1950 that by then people had enough formal schooling that they had learned the trick of classification. But I would still contend that given Luria's interviews, that there have been enormous gains in classification since 1900. The timing of them, I think, is less important. Let me also say as a moral philosopher why these gains of classification are universalizing things. 
and why these games, in terms of taking the hypothetical seriously, concern me. Because I think, as a moral philosopher, you look at how people's reasoning and ethics has improved over the 20th century. Uh, I do taught home at university, and I know about this Piagetian approach for the moral development of the child. But you don't have to know that. You only have to read R.M. Hare. And the finding is that one of the ways in which people have become more sophisticated in moral reasoning is because they have become more sophisticated in classifying and taking the hypothetical seriously. When I was a young man at the University of Chicago, beginning in about, oh, I guess it was 19... Uh, 51 through 57. During that period, you recall that Martin Luther King uh, had his demonstrations in Alabama. And I and many students in my cohort would come home and argue with our parents. Now, I'm not implying that my father was fanatically anti-black. As an Irishman, yes, he was fanatically anti-English. <laughs> and this took so much of his emotional energy that he didn't have enough money left for blacks. But he had some. And he would still say, oh, King, you know, dismissing. And we would say, well, what if you turned up tomorrow morning to have turned black? How would you feel? And he would say, that's the dumbest thing you've ever said. Who do you know that's ever turned black overnight? Uh, in other words, he wouldn't take the hypothetical seriously. We were, of course, saying to him, can't you be consistent about your moral values? They're saying that black people deserve to be treated in a certain way. Imagine a hypothetical situation where color is reversed. We can then say that the persecuted people should be on top, and the others weren't. And much of moral reasoning in the 20th century, and I'm convinced that young people today are much less racist and sexist than they were 50 years ago, has to do with general categories that you try to be logically consistent about in a hypothetical situation seems to us incredible that someone in rural areas in the Middle East would kill their daughter as a point of honor through being raped. And we would say to them, what if you were knocked unconscious and sodomized? You know, would you deserve to be killed? And he would say, that's not in our tribal code. And in other words, moral propositions to him are like precious jewels and heritage that you polish. You don't subject them to hypothetical situations and the test of generalization, you see. Uh, so again, I think the fact that the hypothetical, uh, and of course ravens is entirely hypothetical, isn't it? Ravens, you have symbols that have no relationship whatsoever to the concrete world. And it's all taking hypothetical relationships with these symbols seriously and subjecting them to logical analysis, isn't it? But it doesn't just mean enhanced Raven scores, it means enhanced moral reasoning. Now that doesn't mean I think young people today are more moral than they were in the past. They may be more irresponsible, they may be less capable of curbing their emotions, they may be less honest. Uh, that's a, a, a much larger subject. But they are at least capable of taking the hypothetical seriously and generalizing it in a way that makes them proof against the most extreme forms of racism and sexism. So these, I think, are things that we often overlook. It's a moral spin-off of IQ gains over time that we have profited from to some degree. Well, I want to leave time for questions. I said I would leave 20 minutes. So I want to say another summary thing. Uh, over my 30 years of reflecting about intelligence, and I feel I began to reflect about intelligence really in 1987. And that was 30 years ago when I published my article on Psych Bulletin, IQ Gains in 14 Nations. Three things have struck me as insights that this period produced. And they shouldn't be forgotten. The mere fact that IQ gains may be over doesn't show that they never happened. <laughs> you know. It may be that they're not going to go from now on, but we did have a century of them. And what might we have learned over that century? And in an article that will be published uh, in, I think it's called Perspectives on Psychological Science, 
Sternberg at the end of it, uh, later this year, I reflect on three things, and I think I've actually learned quite a bit from studying IQ gains over time and intelligence over 30 years. But for a popular audience, I wanted to extract three major insights. And these are as follows. First, that the environment never goes away. It may be that twin studies show us that as children mature, that common environment or family influences fade away in terms of current environment. And that the current environment that people match is pretty much correlated with their genes for IQ. So you get the impression that environment has just gone out the window. Uh, this, of course, amuses me. My son is talented at mathematically. About the age of seven or eight, he would come to me with problems about infinity. Say, you realize that there are an infinite number of numbers, but there are also an infinite number of even numbers. So one infinity has twice as many members in it as the other. And while I'm not a mathematician, I'm good at math, and I'd say, you know, that means you can do arithmetic with infinity. So if you subtract the infinity of even numbers from the infinity of all numbers, you get the infinity of odd numbers. And his teachers also helped him. And we both helped him eventually matched an environment that matched his genetic capacity. But we didn't jump out of the window. I mean, the environment didn't disappear. I was there and the teachers were there to make sure that the matching took place. <coughs> and you got the impression from Jensen's equations that if you looked at the twin studies, environment just wasn't around anymore. You know, heritability was 80 to 90 percent. And the implication was, Look how feeble environment is. Environment wasn't feeble. It was there all along. It was just disguised by its correlation with genes. Imagine a sledge with two horses. And originally, they pull in different directions, you know. And the kid is little family environment is hugely influential. But eventually, one horse learns to follow the other horse. And the environment horse learns to be correlated with the gene horse that takes the lead. Well, just because it's now pulling in the same direction as the gene horse doesn't mean it's not there anymore. Its potency is still there. It's just harnessed to genes. And then when you look at IQ gains over time, where there are hardly any genetic differences between cohorts, you find out that this environment horse has immense potency because it's like cutting the gene horse from the sleigh, isn't it? You know, there are no genetic differences from one generation to another. So we've severed the gene horse, and all that's left is the environmental horse, and boy, does it have punch. You know, it brings three-tenths uh, IQ gains per year and five-tenths on ravens. So environment is always there. It's wrong to interpret the twin studies as saying environment is feeble. You interpret the twin studies as saying that environment and genes pull in the same direction which is no guide to how potent environment is when genes aren't around and they aren't pulling in the same direction. Then all that's left pulling the slaves is the environmental horse. And it turns out that that's a very potent horse. So that's the first thing I draw. The second conclusion I draw is that G cannot be taken as an arbiter of how potent IQ gains are over time. Jensen had the system of correlated vectors. And he showed that the magnitude of IQ gain subtest by subtest didn't match the G loadings of those subtests. Well, I don't discount the significance of that. But nonetheless, these IQ gains on individual cognitive abilities shouldn't be ignored just because they don't tally with G. You remember the taxi cab driver. Those that had been long-term taxi cab drivers and the days before we had automatic guidance systems had enlarged hippocampuses. The brain is much more like a muscle than we often expect. I know you have some objection to that analogy, but nonetheless, uh, there is some truth in it. Uh, if you do spatial visualization, the hippocampus seems to enlarge. I would now predict that when automatic guidance systems London taxi cab drivers will have smaller hippocampuses. 
And is it of social significance? Well, it was of social significance if you wanted the cab driver to take you to the right address. Type of social significance, didn't it? Increase in adult vocabulary certainly meant that people could converse on a higher and more stimulating level than when they had lower vocabularies. So the second thing I argue is you can't take whether IQ gains of a more specific start tally with G as an indication as to whether they're socially significant. Highly socially significant, whether they tally with G or not. I suspect that G has to do with things like optimum blood supply in the brain and the quality of your dopamine sprayers. You know, if you have a good sprinkler system for your lawn, it grows better, doesn't it? So you would expect that there would be a G factor that stimulates all type of cognitive abilities in terms of optimum blood supply and, you know, the efficiency of the dopamine sprayers. But that doesn't discard the fact that different portions of the brain grow and diminish. I mean, just as a weightlifter has different muscles than a swimmer, different portions of your brain grow and diminish in terms of these individual cognitive demands by more specialized cognitive abilities. Why should they tally with G? Uh, society doesn't do factor analysis. Society merely wants cab drivers to get people to their destinations. And if the absence of an automatic guidance system pushes up map reading, it's not interested that map reading has a lower G loading than Raven's progressive matrices. Social demands, and the brain responds in terms of social priorities. Third thing that I argue is not using inappropriate arithmetic. That is, Jensen used an equation, which was based on Jane and twin studies, that showed how feeble environment was. And it had to show that you would have to posit an enormous standard deviation gap between black and white in order to explain IQ differences. That's the wrong arithmetic. That was appropriate arithmetic to a child aging and environment becoming more correlated with genes during the child's lifetime. That was the proper use of that arithmetic. The arithmetic that ought to judge intergroup differences is a sociological comparison of those groups. And I try at least to show that a sociological comparison between black and white in America means that the black environment is far less cognitively stimulating for a whole range of reasons and the white environment. Thomas Sowell, my friend, the black economist, he's quite blame and feels I should be liquidated eventually, but in the meantime, we get on quite well. Um, uh, he has pointed out that if blacks have less cognitive exercise on an analytically difficult problem than Chinese kids have more, the Chinese kids will outperform the black kids. Now, I can't today go into a sociological comparison of black and white and show why I think these sociological variables can explain their differences. But the one thing I do know is you don't apply twin study arithmetic to the situation. It's appropriate to a situation where genes and environment come into correlation with one another. It is gratuitous to assume that genes separate black and white in a way so that environmental differences in that context don't count for anything. Well, this gives you an idea of the sort of lessons I've tried to learn from IQ gains over time, and what I make of the fact that those gains are disappearing, or at least seem to be disappearing in highly developed countries. But I do want to remind you, if 50 years from now there have been no IQ gains, that's no excuse for forgetting what lessons we learned while those IQ gains were in full throttle. Happy to take questions or chat with you outside. Over there. <coughs> it, it, it seems to me that your presentation had a lot of for my case, two vague allusions to one thing or another, but I'd like to raise sort of global possibility sure. that one might drape over the kinds of data 
Let me comment on the first part. That's due to the popular presentation. That's fine. Much of what I said I could back up with data. Okay. Right. But I've always been troubled by the thought that maybe a various kinds of item obsolescence might influence findings such as yours. For example, in uh, the First World War Army tests, one of the items was how many legs has a Korean? Yeah. Okay, now by the time we got around to a, what? a Korean. A Korean. A K O R E A N. Okay. <laughs> and uh, many of the people taking the test at that time were from rural places where they'd never seen or heard of a Korean. Okay? Yeah, that's right. And it might sound to them like perhaps it was a kind of insect. That's there. right. There was another variation on that type of item. How many legs has a Hindu? Yeah. They were also <laughs> rare in the United States at that time. But by about 1970, there were 30,000 Koreans living in the Baltimore metropolitan area. And you could hardly go to a dry cleaner without encountering a Korean. This item drastically changed okay. its, its... Could I answer that? Yes. Yes. If anything, it would inhibit the measurement of IQ gains. That is, you measured IQ gains by scoring people on current tests and the older tests with obsolete items. And uh, if they <coughs> did, you know, uh, on the, if you had obsolete items, the kids that you were using in the present time would tend to get those wrong. So rather than there being high on the obsolete norms, they would be lower on those obsolete norms than the current ones. In other words, that actually inhibits the measurement of IQ gains. Here you have kids in 1950, okay? And you give them a test norm in 1910. And then you compare their scores on the two tests. Well, the scores are measured in terms of whether they did better on the earlier test than the more recent one. And the more obsolete items that were in the earlier test, you would actually mute the estimate of IQ gains, as you say. Don't follow that. I'm afraid well, All right. They would tend to get right the number of... The kids in 1950 would turn to get that item right, wouldn't they? I would think. Then that would boost their scores on the earlier test because they got it right. And the yes. kids at that time would tend to get it wrong. Correct? And so the scores on the earlier test, thanks to the absolute items, would be depressed for the modern audience. The more those scores are depressed, the lower you get an estimate of IQ gains. Uh, they, they get more items correct. That's right, and they'd have higher they, norms. But they get more items correct. You mean they get more items correct, and that depresses their score on the norms of the time? I don't know they're using the norms of the time. That's how they measure them. If you look at it item by item. If you look at it item by item. Take your item. Take, take kids in 1900. Right. Let's assume that the average kid in 1900 gets 50, 50 items out of 100 right. That's an IQ of 100, okay, if the average kid got that. All right? Okay, now you come up to 1950, and there's this item about the number of kids who, the Koreans with the legs. Well, the 1950 kids would have a more sophisticated approach to that item. As you say, they've seen lots of Koreans. So they would tend to get that item right, wouldn't they? Right. Well, the kids in the past got it wrong. So compared to the norms of 1910, that would inflate the scores of the 1950 kids. Now, the higher they get on the norms of the earlier tests, the lower you measure IQ gains. That's right. That's right. Yes, they look smarter. Compared to the they look smarter compared to the older kids. I'm on the side of being confused by your explanation as well, but perhaps we have a, a, a second question while we figure out. We'll what talk about this. <laughs> uh, obsolete items actually in, uh, deflate the measurement of IQ gains. Yeah. I'm a, a little confused about your first insight. Of the three yes, at the end. About 
just differences. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Differences in environment. Within a cohort. Within a population, within a society. Yeah, within, okay. that's right. Within because a generation. You can't, I mean, that's the point about it. Exactly. That is the point about it. No, no. Listen. Differences predicting differences in yeah. uh, that so you're you're explaining variance. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and that's Quite what heritability point. is. That is what explaining it is. difference in variation due to either environment or, or genes. genes. That's right. Well, if you optimize the environment for every person, if they were perfectly optimized, You'd have heritability the, would be perfect. No, no, I'm Michael had a question. 
dismissed it in that way. The, the other thing is going to the anti-Flynn effect, as people have taken to calling it. Sorry about that, but there's now an anti-Flynn effect. <laughs> We have a huge meta-analysis of this, with 66 observations, about 300,000 individuals, which is coming up with evolutionary behavioral sciences, and we found the number one cause of it is immigration. And it's getting worse over time. So I think everything you're saying there is, is absolutely true, but maybe as a complement to what you're saying, you can go back to the work you did in 2001 with, with Dickens. You can look at these social multipliers, and you can think about what happens when you start reducing, say, the genetic potential for intelligence within a population, and how that's going to rebound on the sort of environments which you pick up on, which may sustain the, the, the effect and may push it into reverse. I have no doubt that there has been some deterioration of genetic quality for intelligence since late Victorian times. And, uh, without going into your data, which is interesting data, we could say that purely in terms of a sort of mating. That is, people, uh, is, back in Victorian times, I take it, where there wasn't much birth control, the more affluent people tended to raise big families to maturity, and poverty-stricken people, their kids died out. But, of course, over time, now the upper classes have more access to birth control, and the more accomplished people are having fewer children, while people in lower social classes often have very great difficulties. <coughs> and utilizing these devices and are having more children. And I would say that over a hundred years or so, if you take that perspective, there's been a significant drop. I didn't work that into my talk because it was too complicated. And I preferred to take a cohort that was only 15 years apart, you know, from the cottage, cottage studies. Because in that period, the business of genetic decline would have been pretty null. You know, and what we would see, well, it would not be huge. It wouldn't be as huge as sociological change. Up to one point? Uh, in well, G let's take the age of people who are gaining at a, 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 a something over those 15 points. Now, clearly, that is a factor in keeping aged people healthy, keeping them intellectually involved. That is a sociological factor that swamps the genetic factor. Can I, can, I, can I take us back? Sure. Can I take us back to Archimedes? Yes. <laughs> uh, I will to tear my promise. What I'm wondering is whether we have a generic problem which is bigger than the Flynn effect and bigger than the Woodley effect, which is a measurement problem. We don't have tests which tell us what the specific difficulty of an item is. The Argelians think they do. They do. So that's why I'm saying let's give them a bit more of attention here. And let's yeah. go back to Archimedes in his bath, and yeah. he sees displacement, and he works out. That's right. Now, the question is, is that one problem? I think it is a problem. It's an insight. Let's call it a, a score of difficulty, when you first work it out, of, I don't know, 10, 100, whatever you like. If we have children who now are less able to solve that problem, That's right. then by the Archimedes standard, we are dumber. That's right. You can do a subsidiary defense of the Flynn-type position by saying, ah, it's the nature of schooling. Yeah. If we could just teach them to it, yeah. then we get around it. Okay? But I'm saying that I think that the reason I can't distinguish often between a real deterioration or a gain or an inflation effect is that we don't have fundamental measures. Maths, of course, in its basics hasn't changed. Yes. I think you're saying we're not teaching maths correctly, but perhaps maths is with its purity, which Russell was always about, it's a good fundamental measure. Yeah. Digits backwards, that yeah. hasn't changed. Yeah, that's right. So it either hasn't changed, or on the more slightly complicated Archimedes level, we got worse. Well, let me say, by the way, that before they're given the Archimedes item, they're given a very full description of the background. And let's say, and also, the questions that arise out of that item are not just one. There are a whole series of questions that have to do with the sophistication of their analysis. So at least there's an effort 
Indeed. And I don't know that there was ever a time in America where people were really analytically in the school analyzing Archimedes. Yes. I mean, certainly if you posit that 50 years ago, teachers spent a hell of a lot of time on that problem and didn't spend it today. Yeah. But that seems improbable. Yeah. Indeed. And I think the Piagetian data is very disturbing. Yeah. Because, again, take the high jump. That's an absolute measure. You can either jump the damn thing or you can't. And if you took, let's say, the uh, decrease of performance of high jumpers at the mean, yeah. you would say, well, the number who can do seven feet is going to go down. Yeah. But it's going to still be at 1%, 10%. The number who can actually do it is a half to a fourth of that. And that seems to me terribly disturbing. That's why I say the rot may start at the top. Now, we don't have enough data. You know, I wish we had more. We'll have more data if more people will use Piagetian tests, yeah. which I find very difficult to persuade people to do. The Piagetian tests, though, are highly correlated with standardness. They are indeed. Yeah. But this is yeah. one respect in which they're not. Decimination of people in the very top category of performance. They are very highly correlated, and that has led us astray. Now, the data that I'll present, you know, the data I'm presenting will show that there is one way of that misleading you, and that is, okay, people are down at the top, but you find they're much more down at the top. Now, that won't show up on a conventional IQ test. You'll just say, now the number of people above 130 should be such and such, and it is such and such, and that is fairly predictable from the mean. You know, you, you find that uh, the phenomenon is obscure. You could do digits forward and backward. That's right. I'm going to step in, but I guess we'll... Sure. And I'm happy to go on discussing, particularly with yourself, if you want to. <laughs> <laughs>